Hi, I'm Christian from Playfair Audio and today I'm going to show you how to use dynamic grading for shaping audio dynamics. Dynamic grading is a novel dynamics processor that lets you not only see the dynamics of your audio tracks, but you can also manipulate the dynamics easily and with intention. That way you can have a lot more control and a lot more possibilities compared to using compressors and expanders. As we will see in this video. So without further ado, let's dive right in. This here is dynamic grading and you might notice a few differences to the original release if you've used it before. The 1.2 update you see here will be released in just a few weeks. The most important part is the main display. Here you have the dynamic histograms of your input signal to the left and your output signal to the right. And you have a couple of handles that you can use to adjust the dynamics. You can define the dynamic regions present in the input signal and then adjust the output signal just the way you want by moving around, squeezing or stretching the regions. To the right, you have some more controls to adjust the analysis and processing algorithms further. With the spectrum knob, you can adjust the balance between high and low frequencies for the underlying level follower. This is especially useful when you have very dark or very bright signals. In practice, you want to set this between 2 and 4 most of the time. The response time determines how fast the level follower and thus the processing reacts to level changes. And with the release time, you can adjust how fast the algorithm recovers after significant sound events. Finally, with the new amount knob, you can blend seamlessly between a fully processed signal and an unprocessed one. At the bottom, there are more controls to tweak the histogram display. You can adjust the time frame for the dynamic histograms as well as reset them to more quickly update the measurement after you've changed something. You can now also enable additional displays like level meters and the dynamic curve. There's a new utility menu with functions like copy and paste and of course a bypass button. Also new in version 1.2 is a new smart latency feature that makes sure the plug-in latency isn't higher than necessary. Dynamics are all about how loud or soft different notes are compared to each other. We say a recording is dynamic when there's a large difference between the loudest and the softest sounds. But using just our ears or more traditional tools like level meters, it's hard to tell what that means for a specific recording. Dynamic grading solves this using its dynamic histograms, which are the two graphs you see here. Just imagine a really fast level meter that measures loudness all the time and someone recording the readings and running a statistic over it. This graph here shows how often a reading of for example minus 20 dB has been recorded compared to how often we've seen minus 30 dB over some period of time. You can adjust the time frame over which the data is evaluated with a slider on the bottom left and you can also clear the histograms anytime. Sounds complicated? Well, I keep saying it's harder to explain than it is to understand. So let's look at a practical example and you'll probably find out it's actually quite intuitive. Here I have an arpeggiated synth sequence that has quite some dynamic range. There are loud notes and soft notes all together forming this nice little pattern. Watch how the dynamic histograms react to the audio. Notice that there is a broad range where you have some significant readings. Now what happens if we take away all the dynamics by making all the notes the same velocity? With this completely undynamic version of the same pattern, you see that the histogram concentrates around a small level range. There's much less variation and you can see that directly in the histogram. Note at this point that the absolute length of these bars has no practical meaning. It's all about the shape or distribution of the readings. So the main takeaway for now is that in the dynamic histogram a broad bump tells you that there's a lot of dynamics while a sharp peak shows you are dealing with some very static material. By looking at the dynamic histogram you can quickly find where in the dynamic range the significant bits of your audio material are located and how what you hear is distributed across the dynamic range. Music 
Now every audio track is different and dynamics can be quite complex. But nevertheless, there are some typical characteristics that apply to most practical audio signals. To start easy, here's a simple example. The dynamics of this signal are broad but not extreme and we see a typical bell shape. You may find this type of shape very often in practice. While developing dynamic grading, we found out that it's really useful to think about the dynamic histogram in terms of three distinct dynamic regions. These are, from top to bottom, the punch, the body and the floor. The punch contains the loudest events in the audio. It's the accents, the attacks, the musically most important rhythmic elements. Below that we have the body. This is the sustain of notes, the ringing of percussion instruments and the ghost notes which are not as accentuated as what we have in the punch. While the punch range is home to most rhythmic elements, the body range is where the tonal elements such as notes, harmonies and timbre live. Finally, right below the body range there is the floor. These are the low-level details of the music, like echoes and reverberation, but also unwanted elements such as noise or microphone bleed. A good way to think of it is as the space between the notes. Note that most of the time there are no clear boundaries between these ranges. Punch, body and floor do overlap and you can normally not isolate them completely. But in practice you can work with them creatively and achieve a wide range of outcomes. So far we've only looked at dynamic histograms, which is interesting enough already, but you probably have a mix to deliver and want to know how dynamic grading can help with that. So it's finally time to get our hands dirty. All you need to do is use these handles here to tell dynamic grading what you want it to do. They are based on the three ranges we just talked about. The thicker bars in the middle are for the body range. Then above that you have the punch and below the body you have the floor. The markers to the left are called source markers. They represent the input signal, so by moving these you determine where the punch, body and floor ranges are in your input signal. The markers to the right are for the output signal, so by adjusting the target markers you tell the plugin where you want these ranges to be in the result. This way you can independently adjust the dynamics of the punch, body and floor ranges. For example, when the target range is smaller than the source range, you get compression in that range, which means you're reducing dynamic range. When it's the other way around, you get expansion, effectively increasing dynamics. Finally, you can also adjust the output level by just moving all the target markers together. You've already learned the concept of punch, body and floor ranges and how to find them in an audio signal. We also just covered the basics of using the source and target markers. Now the remaining question is, what do you need to do in order to achieve the results you're after? When and where would you want to compress or expand and why? Let's start with the body range. As we've talked about before, it's where the meat of audio signals typically is. When you compress here, you can increase the presence of the track in the mix and tie the signal together. On the other hand, by expanding the body range, you can create more space and enhance the rhythm and groove. The punch range is where the loudest notes and the attacks live. If you compress here, you can tame the attacks and move the signal more towards the background. By expanding the punch, you can increase the impact of accents and move the signal more to the foreground. Finally, the floor range is, as we learned, the space between the notes. Down here, compression leads to exaggerated details like reverberation or noises, which can be quite cool as an artistic effect. By applying expansion, on the other hand, we can reduce reverberation and noise and thus clean up the signal and achieve a drier overall sound. With these few simple concepts, you can achieve perfect control over your track dynamics and it's much easier to apply advanced techniques compared to classic compressors or expanders. With some practice, you'll probably find yourself applying a similar strategy to most audio recordings. To better illustrate, let's walk through a typical instrument track together. Here I have an electric piano recording that we'll quickly adjust using kind of a standard recipe that's really useful for just about everything. The first step is to listen a bit and let dynamic grading build up the histogram. 
Now here we can identify roughly what the punch, body and floor ranges might be. By grabbing these lines between the handles, I can roughly set the ranges without doing any processing yet. Now we can start making some adjustments. With most signals, you'll want to apply compression to the body range. Often that can be a quite strong compression. To squeeze the body without affecting the punch and floor ranges, we can just move up this floor range bar like this. Now we have a much more compact body, which will help it sit smoothly in the mix. With this we've also brought up everything in the floor range, which very often we don't want. In this case the reverberation is a bit too much. We can exaggerate it even more by compressing the floor like this. Might make for a great artistic effect, but here we want something cleaner, so let's expand the floor downwards instead. Note how the reverberation goes away and the signal becomes much cleaner, without sounding too gated. We can set just the right amount of expansion precisely. We've left the punch untouched so far, which is great, because although we have heavily compressed the body, the accents and attacks remain vital and sound alive. This is quite similar to applying something like parallel compression, but it's much easier to control. Of course, we can also compress or expand the punch, which is a great way to control how upfront the signal is in the mix. Notice how the track sounds farther away when I compress the punch. And conversely, when I bring it back up and expand it, it moves ever more into your face. At this point we have outlined the rough processing we want, and now it's a good time to adjust the spectrum, response and release parameters to taste. As a general guideline, play around with the spectrum parameter until it sounds just right. In most practical cases, the sweet spot will be somewhere around the default value of 3.0. A short response time will work well on percussive material and when you want to really crack down on a signal. A longer response time will lead to smoother results. For the release time, try to look for the lowest setting that still sounds smooth and natural. With a bit more fine tuning of the ranges, you can now polish the result. Nice! And finally, we can now adjust the overall level. My suggestion is to align the bulk of the body range to a common standard level of your choice, ideally somewhere around the minus 30 to minus 40 dB mark. When you apply this strategy to all the tracks in your mix, you'll have a great starting point for a dense but vital mix with a lot of depth given all track faders are set around 0 dB. And that's all you need to know to get started with dynamic grading. Now it's your turn to try it out. Go to our website on playfairaudio.com and download the 14 day free trial. Ask your questions in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more in-depth videos coming soon. Thanks for watching.